very, very excited to be here. And um, in fact, this is me with my mother. Um, and my mother is no ordinary mother. Um, given sort of the talent that's standing here in this room, I feel very confident that a lot of you here have a mother just like my mother. And my mother is a tiger mom, which means that uh, she's very, very demanding, very perfectionistic. Um, and so when I told my tiger mom that I was invited to this very prestigious event here and I was going to be giving a talk at Friday morning you know, at 9 a.m., um, <clears throat> you know, if you had a non-tiger mom, she would probably say something like, that's, you know, congratulations, Julie Lynn, that's great. My tiger mom said, 9 a.m. on a Friday? I said, yeah, I think it's, you know, kind of a big deal. And she said, is anyone actually going to show up? <laughs> so could you please allow me to take a little panoramic photo of you. So my tiger mom is convinced that people showed up today. Thank you. And she likes it when you guys wave, actually. She really loves that. Yeah, awesome. OK, give me one second here. Oh, this is so great. This might be the biggest audience I've ever had like at, at this time in the morning. So OK, here we go. Oh, so great. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, she is digging this. All right. Oh, this is such a big room, too. So looks like there's so many bodies here. I'm going to even get you. OK, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, so, um, so there she is. In fact, actually, uh, my research that got published last fall related to 3D printing actually made the front page of the Toronto Star. And once again, I made the mistake of going to my tiger mom and well, telling her she should, might want to buy the Toronto Star that day. And when I asked her, you know, are you proud of me? She's like, well, you know, the article, it, it wasn't finished on the first page. You actually have to flip to the end of the <laughs> front section to get to it. I'm like, okay, right, thanks. Anyways, so yeah, so as Christina mentioned, uh, my area of focus, first of all, I love technology. And for those of you who are creative types, uh, technology is a very powerful medium uh, for us to express ourselves. Um, but as well, I've always been fascinated by how we can start applying technology to benefit humanity. And uh, one of my areas of focus is 3D printing. So I'm considered a, uh, a leading expert in 3D printing medical supplies in um, remote, challenging, and difficult to work places. So for those of you who don't know much about 3D printing, uh, this is me with my 3D printed selfie. So, um, and this, is, this slide actually is a nice, uh, sort of a nice um, a pictorial that explains how 3D printing works. So to 3D print something, you need a 3D digital model, the physical object you want to print. So that's me there, that's the model. And then um, you need some 3D design software to make edits. And you'll also need some sort of uh, printer software that'll convert the uh, final 3D model into a printable file. And that's what you see in the middle panel there. And the last thing you need to 3D print something is a 3D printer with printer material. So that is the picture you see on the far right there. So, um, all in all, um, you basically, I actually went to a studio here in Toronto, it's called Self Traits, and um, I stood in their studio and they actually had a whole bunch of cameras, about 134 uh, DSLR cameras plus six strobe lights in kind of the walls of what was like a circus tent. And in one snapshot, uh, those cameras were able to get enough information about me to generate a, a very high resolution 3D model which we were eventually able to send to a printer uh, that was able to print things in, in color. So I tell people I have a 3D printed Star Trek selfie that's made on a replicator. <laughs> and speaking of Star Trek replicators, um, they're actually real. The second generation 3D printer was launched at the space station this spring. And so I tell people having a 3D printer is like having a 3D photocopier or a mini factory that sits on your desktop. And so this is sped up video footage of a ground-based version of the first Star Trek replicator. It's making a dental tool I helped design. And it works just like a desktop 3D printer. A plastic strand feeds into the printer head, which heats up the plastic so it melts. The printer head deposits the liquid plastic onto a platform. And once a horizontal layer is printed, that platform drops down and the next layer gets printed. And this process continues until you have a final three-dimensional shape of the object you want. So uh, what you're looking at here is the first functional object that was 3D printed in space. It's actually a panel for the printer head which holds internal wiring in place. And because the first functional object 3D printed in space is part of the 3D printer itself, this means that the first Star Trek replicator is partially self-replicating. 
And so I tell people, if you're going to go someplace remote, um, you might want to take two 3D printers with you. Because if one 3D printer breaks, you can use the second 3D printer to print a replacement part. <laughs> so with 3D printing technology, physical objects can be stored as digital files. This means that you can uplink hardware to space or email medical supplies around the world. So what you're looking at here is a uh, 3D printed ratchet wrench that was custom designed on the ground, uplinked to the space station, and 3D printed in space. You can download this tool file for free off the NASA website and 3D print it using a local 3D printer in your workplace, uh, in the public library, a local school, or even in somebody's home. And so remember, with 3D printing, right, physical objects can be stored as digital files. That means 3D designs can now be innovated and crowdsourced on an unprecedented global scale. So last year, I uh, pitched to the NASA officials that I knew that we should actually have a global 3D printing design challenge on making 3D printable medical supplies for the space station, which they actually launched during the International Space Apps Challenge last year, which is a um, yearly uh, global hackathon um, that NASA uh, runs. Um, and there are a number of challenges uh, in which um, hackathon participants are encouraged to address to try and solve problems that affect space travel as well as life here on Earth. Another thing is that NASA has recently funded uh, a company to actually uh, build and launch a recycler to, so you could take either scrap plastic waste or maybe a um, 3D printed object that is broken or you're just not going to use anymore and um, recycle it back into printer feedstock. So the reality is, for any space mission, astronauts are not going to be able to take whatever it is that they need. Right? There's just not enough money, not enough space. Um, it's very expensive to launch things into space. So what's going to happen in the future is that uh, you know, space mission crews are going to be bringing or uplinking 3D digital files so they can actually print supplies, uh, spare parts, tools, and even habitats on demand locally. So I was very lucky. I was selected to be part of a primary crew for an all-female uh, crew for uh, a simulated mission to an asteroid um, at NASA Johnson Space Center. And so, um, actually, we came up with a little uh, space mission badge there. Um, the name of the facility that I lived in for one month is called uh, the Human Exploration Research Analog, HERA for short. And because we were an all-female crew, um, I suggested for our mission badge design that we actually select, uh, or we actually base it on the eye of a peacock feather, because that is the symbol of HERA, uh, the Greek goddess of women. Thank you. <laughs> So, so if you look at it you know, from a distance, you'll see that it resembles the eye of a peacock feather. And as well, so we have uh, the earth um, and, and sort, of this, uh, sort of the central part. It's the eye of the peacock uh, feather there. And then um, as well, we've got uh, the moon orbiting the earth, a near-earth asteroid, and then Mars is the orange sphere there. Because these represent past, current, and future um, destinations for uh, human uh, space exploration. And uh, the names of the all-female crew are listed um, in the border in alphabetical order. And as well, actually, uh, the 30th anniversary of the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster occurred during our mission. So I suggested that we uh, put seven stars to represent uh, the Challenger crew members um, as a tribute to them um, in our mission badge. And as well, actually, remember there's a 3D printer on board the space station. We had a 3D printer in our facility, which I got to test for the first time. I thought that was very nice of the mission uh, controllers to schedule me, the 3D printing expert, to actually use the 3D printer for the first time. And so, yeah, so um, as well, <laughs> I'm a professional puppeteer. I have my own Muppets. <laughs> I think Muppets should go to space. Um, actually, I think Slimy has gone to the moon, um, if you've been watching Sesame Street. So, um, but, um, but yeah, so I've, I've actually done another analog mission as well, not just to an asteroid, but... Um, a while back, I was an analog astronaut at the Mars Desert Research Station, and I brought my 3D printer with me um, inside a Karen suitcase, and I used solar energy to power my 3D printer to make medical supplies, which is what you see here. So I made a custom finger splint to treat an injured astronaut, a scalpel blade handle in case we had to perform surgery on an astronaut, and as well a two-in-one dental tool. 
And so I actually now have a print slot reserved to uplink files to the space station and 3D print the first medical tools in space. And so once again, I decided that I should design my own space, space mission badge, which is what you see here. And so the red planet depicts Mars. The Earth symbolizes global health. The star pattern in the upper half is a southern hemisphere constellation called Sculptor because 3D printing is a form of digital sculpture. And uh, the red chevron um, is NASA's symbol for aeronautics because I want to use drones, 3D printed drones, to actually resupply my 3D printer remote medical facilities. And uh, as well, we have actually the star pattern in the bottom half there, that is the constellation Taurus. So um, I actually had one of my engineering interns digitally sketch uh, the badge elements so we could send it to the uh, company for it to be made. And um, his, he actually has a, a 3D printing company called Taurus, but his constellation or his astrological sign is Taurus. So I decided to include that constellation as a sort of artist signature as part of the badge. And as well, um, the 3D from the logo, those little squiggles there, those actually that flank both sides of the logo, those actually um, represent your heart's electrical signal um, because we want to signify that health and wellness are the goals of this project. And last but not least, we have two stars on either side of the 3D from the logo, uh, which symbolizes solar energy, which you can use to power 3D printers in space and on Earth. So, and as I uh, mentioned before, the space station is solar powered. So I decided to use solar energy to power my 3D printer to make medical supplies when I was at the Mars Desert Research Station. And uh, as I said before, I'm very, very interested in using affordable, scalable technologies uh, to positively impact humanity. And when I came back from my Mars analog mission, I realized that there's 1.4 billion people who don't have access to electricity. And in many remote off-grid regions, simple medical items are expensive and can take a long time to arrive at a medical clinic. So when I returned home, I built and tested a solar-powered, ultra-portable 3D printing system that fits inside a carry-on suitcase. So doctors and other healthcare workers traveling to a remote uh, region can bring this 3D printer with them to make a range of hygienic, functional medical supplies at the point of use. But what's even more interesting is that they could actually leave these 3D printers behind after teaching the local community how to design and 3D print their own solutions. So having this entire solar powered 3D printing system fit inside a Caron suitcase um, allows for safer handling of delicate printer components and saves money by avoiding check baggage fees. <laughs> I wanted this to be a plug and play system so it would be simple for people to use. And I published uh, this design in a uh, medical journal so other people could build their own suitcase solar power 3D printers. And so, um, so yeah, so um, as I said before, so I thought, okay, we could use solar power uh, three, um, suitcase 3D printers to impact the over 1.4 billion people who live without access to electricity and who also reside in medically underserviced regions. But I bet you there's another way that we could use 3D printing to impact over a billion lives. And it turns out that one in seven people on this planet have some sort of disability. And many people with disabilities need but can't get custom assistive devices that allow them to participate fully in everyday life. And assistive devices can be very simple, like this uh, 3D printed button hook uh, we designed for patients with arthritis and we also shaped it so it looks like a, like a sword. <laughs> and assistive devices can be also very complex, like this 3D printed uh, prosthetic hand uh, that uh, we're making for a uh, amputee and uh, this hand actually is designed to have haptic feedback. So the problem is, is that there is an incredible global shortage of skilled workers who can craft these uh, custom assist devices for patients with disabilities. So if you have a disability and if um, you, your assist device breaks or gets lost, it is actually an incredible challenge to get it replaced. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to spend time to research some, to find somebody who can actually rebuild it for you, replace it for you. Um, they may not live close to you, so you may have to travel a long distance to see that person, that skilled worker. 
And that worker is also going to charge you, uh, rightfully so, for their labor time and material costs. And these are all incredible barriers for people with disabilities. But now, with 3D printing technology, you can actually very inexpensively obtain a 3D model of an assistive device, give that 3D printable file to a person with a disability, and they can just replace it using local 3D printers in their community. So I met a, a local musician, um, and he unfortunately lost a number of fingers on his playing hand after a terrible injury. And he wants to be able to play the guitar again, but he only has um, his thumb and his little finger to use. And so it's very difficult for him to hold the guitar pick. So his uh, therapist made by hand a little customized handle um, so his two remaining fingers fit exactly in this handle and he can hold the pick and strum and, and rehearse. So what I did is I downloaded a free app that turns my smartphone into a 3D scanner and I scanned this handle. And then I used free software to make a few edits and uh, another uh, open source uh, printer software to convert that edited 3D model into a printable file. And then I 3D printed it using a 3D printer that's identical to the one that I have at home. And this is the 3D printed pick handle here with the guitar pick. So I think this is incredible, right? This is a nice example, this patient story is a nice example of how we can use 3D printing technology to save time and money for people with disabilities. And what I also learned from this experience, and by the way, like I met the patient on a Friday, and we figured out how to um, apply these technologies, and we had a 3D printed pick handle for him by the end of the weekend. Um, so this all happened very, very quickly. Is that what this experience taught me is that if you have a smartphone, you now have access to a 3D scanner, which means that you can now get 3D models of things, of physical objects. And then on top of that, there are lots of different uh, open source 3D um, modeling software programs that you can use. And not only can you use them, but um, these programs often have video tutorials, so you can teach yourself how to use them. But here in Toronto, our public library system actually offers free workshops on how to use 3D printers and how to learn how to uh, use 3D modeling software programs. And as well, 3D printers are very, very inexpensive, which means they're becoming increasingly accessible. Typical desktop 3D printers range from anywhere from $300 to $3,000. And um, you don't have to buy one. You can use one in the public libraries here. They're in schools, they're in maker spaces, they're in print shops, and they're even in people's homes. So why I think this is really exciting for everybody here is that 3D printing doesn't just democratize healthcare, it democratizes innovation. So today, it's possible to take your idea, draw it digitally using free software, convert that 3D drawing into a printable file using free software, and then use a local 3D printer to make your idea physically real just by clicking print. So I want you to be aware of this very, very accessible technology because now it's possible to take what's virtual and make it physically real. So another issue that we face is, uh, in, in the, health, the healthcare system is that what I call clinical grade, meaning high quality medical equipment is often very, very expensive. But what I'm hoping uh, in the future and what we're working at 3D and, uh, for MD to build is actually the ability to be able to go online and select and download a file and uh, 3D print uh, medical equipment locally. So this is uh, what we call a two-point discriminator. And uh, it measures uh, nerve function. And it, this is actually a wonderful device. Um, it was invented by a Canadian hand surgeon who specializes in nerve surgery. And I like this device a lot because it's very valid. It's very accurate, meaning that it measures exactly what it should be measuring. At the same time, this device is great because it's very reliable, meaning that if you use the same device on different patients, you'll, you should get you know, accurate results. If different physicians use the same device on different patients, they should get accurate results. 
The problem with this device is that it's very expensive. And I don't know a lot of physicians who actually own this device. This is what we typically use to measure two-point discrimination. I'm not kidding. It's a paper clip. Now, a paper clip is great because it's cheap, right? They're kind of plentiful, well, at least in our environment it is. And what you do is you kind of unfurl it and you try and sort of adjust you know, the tines of the paper clip um, to measure two-point discrimination. The problem with this device is that it's not very accurate and it's not very reliable. So I've been working um, with high school students here and um, I asked a uh, local high school student if um, she could use free 3D modeling software to create a two-point uh, discriminator uh, that, uh, that's shaped like a ninja star, which is what you see here. And so the nice thing about the uh, 3D printed ninja star discriminator, oh gosh, you know what, I have it here so I can pass it out to you guys. And uh, just so you know, actually, not only did we create uh, the discriminator um, using 3D printing, but the case for it is also 3D printed as well. So uh, the advantage of uh, this 3D printed discriminator is that it's um, very, very accurate, much more than paperclip, but it's also a lot cheaper, about 10 times cheaper than the uh, gold standard device I showed you um, in the earlier slide. It's made out of biodegradable plastic, so it's environmentally friendly, and we can customize it. Right? With 3D printing, I could uh, put your initials in it um, so you know it belongs to you. Nobody else would be taking it. And as well, the, the fun part is, is that it was co-invented by a FEMA high school student here. So what we're working towards, 3D Friendly's vision, is that we're building a digital library, like iTunes. But instead of songs, people will select and download quality-tested, affordable, and even customizable medical supplies on demand that they could 3D print locally. And so yeah, so, um, but as well I wasn't content to stop there of course, right? Um, how else can I apply 3D printing technologies to impact over a billion lives? So it turns out that um, about two billion people live on less than two dollars a day. And uh, I was uh, invited to speak uh, in Washington DC recently uh, two members of um, the World Bank, and I was explaining to them how we could potentially use 3D printers to reduce extreme poverty. So imagine if uh, you go on vacation and you, you're going to go, you're headed to an impoverished area where, in which a lot of tourist destinations are, and uh, you decide to take a um, solar powered 3D printing system inside your carry on suitcase and uh, you deliver it to that community who's requested it, and um, you teach them how to use it, and you leave it behind, and then they can actually start potentially recycling, recycling plastic waste to make into printer feedstock, which they would then use um, with the 3D printers to create uh, goods, products, um, that they could actually sell to generate income locally and build sustainable livelihoods. So yeah, so um, in fact, there's a social enterprise in India that's been training um, urban waste pickers uh, to take the plastic waste that they normally collect and sell for about one to two dollars a day and uh, use those reclaimer devices and uh, to turn that plastic into printer filament. And uh, now these uh, waste pickers could earn uh, potentially up to 15 to 20 dollars a day for the same amount of plastic collected. And just so you know, one to two percent of the world's population are waste pickers. Their job is to go through our trash, find out what's sellable, and that's how they make their living. So I also explain to people that, I mean, I use 3D printing for medical supplies, but the truth is you're not just restricted to um, medical resources, right? I mean, you basically have Walmart in a box. It's a 3D photocopier. It's a little mini factory. So I have some... Uh, very esteemed colleagues, they've been um, working with using 3D printers uh, during uh, humanitarian disasters as a way to provide um, very local, um, customized, uh, tailored humanitarian aid. And, and they've realized that, wow, you can use 3D printers across a number, a range of sectors, uh, not just healthcare. So people ask me, well, what would you 3D print first? And uh, the truth is, I actually wouldn't print medical supplies first, even though that's what people know me for. I would actually print 
parts of a wind power system. So I would have a way to charge the battery that powers my printer at night. I would also, then I would start printing spare parts so I could assemble a second 3D printer. And the third thing I would print is uh, uh, parts of, uh, of drones. So I could also um, fly drones, assemble these drones, and um, fly these drones to uh, resupply things I can't 3D print at my remote medical facility. Uh, which of course actually now takes me to my piloting background, which Christina so kindly mentioned. And so one of the things I'm working on launching now is a, uh, a drone or UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, flight training program. Because I think UAVs have been great for the military, but I think that they were even more extraordinarily amazing for social good. There are a number of humanitarian applications that you can use with UAVs. And so I'm getting ready to launch a uh, UAV uh, flight training program uh, with the uh, Air Cadet League of Canada. That's actually how I got uh, my pilot's licenses, was uh, through scholarships through that youth program. But as well, there's no reason why we can't train all of you as well as Girl Guides, Boy Scouts, uh, to um, uh, pilot UAVs for what I call social good. So yeah, so what's, um, what we're also launching this uh, summer as well too is something called the Medical Makers Program. And so we bring innovators like you together with patients, as well as uh, experts in 3D printing, uh, healthcare professionals, and we work together to build scalable, customized solutions for real patients. So this is something that you're interested in, and there's no, you don't have to have a design background, you just have to be enthusiastic. Please come see me and talk to me, because we can build things that will help patients we know, people we will never meet, and continue to help people after we're gone. Because once we have that digital file, we have it forever. And that means that somebody else can use it 100 years from now, that somebody else can download that file and 3D print it on the other side of the planet, or in an off-world mission. So yeah, so hopefully I've inspired you all to be medical makers, yay. <laughs> and uh, so the deal is if you um, come and volunteer with us, you get a uh, laptop sticker when you start off. And then when you finish your first project for a patient, you earn your space mission badge, which I think is a fair deal. So anyways, I hope you all live long and prosper. And may the force be with you. Thank you.